From the United Nations Office to the African Union, this is She Stands for Peace, a podcast series where I explore the state of the women peace and security agenda in Africa through a series of conversations with key actors. In the podcast, we ask the central question, 20 years after UNSCR 1325, how far have we come? I'm Dr. Yemsi Akimbobala, your host, and today I'm joined by Marwa Azamat, an IT engineer and advocate for digital peace building and a feminist internet. Marwa joins me from Morocco, and we have a conversation about the gaps and opportunities for the digital inclusion of women in achieving Africa's women peace and security objectives. Mawa, it's a pleasure to speak to you today. Now, you are an IT engineer with a background in human rights law, and you have done a lot of work in coding and cybersecurity. And you also describe yourself as a digital peace builder. So tell us about your career journey and explain to us what a digital peace builder is. Thank you. And thank you for having me here today. And I think it's a very important conversation to have because we we tend to actually see the digital as a standalone field, whereas in a digital age, it it just makes sense to actually see whatever is happening online as a continuum of everything that we actually experience in in life. And that's why I actually label myself as digital peace builder, because I see that building peace is not just about having sort of blueprints or negotiating with people or just um, turning down a conflict. But it's more about how we actually socialize and interact online and and try to to understand these dynamics that the digital age has brought in. So you're building your movement of digital activists and you advocate for a feminist internet towards social justice. What does that mean? The feminist internet, I guess, it's just the reference to the kind of internet, not just one internet, that we as feminist movement try to to reimagine and re-envision because we believe that the kind of spaces and roads and avenues that we have online don't actually work for women and people of diverse genders and sexualities. So it actually makes perfect sense to re-envision the kind of spaces we would like to see online, especially knowing that the people who design these technologies are are just far away from our realities. So we try to reinvent these realities and make sure that everyone's voice is actually included. So now let's turn to the digital inclusion of women in the Women, Peace and Security agenda. Have you come across some exemplary examples that really demonstrate how the peace building industry should be reimagining its use of digital in peace building in order to improve its record regarding women's participation? For example, you spoke just then about the extent to which women are participants in the production of these technology. But also we can speak specifically in peace building around, you know, early response mechanisms and women's participation in that and other aspects of the four pillars of the WPS agenda. So what are some of the examples that you see that you feel that the peace building industry might begin to build on as it reimagines a digital peace building approach? I think it's it's a very crucial question to ask, specifically when we see, for instance, how the conflict in Myanmar has emerged or the conflicts in India, it has actually taken another like trajectory and it just escalated because of the online spaces and because of the hate speech that or the speech online that was just fueled with hate, with extremism and with sort of like tribalism and, and everything in that sense. So I think it just makes perfect sense to understand that now Peace building, again, it's not just about a negotiation at the table, you know, because so much is happening behind our screens that actually takes a toll on people, on people's lives, and that actually change the direction of, of that peace building that we're trying to do in the real life. So I think what we actually need to agree on as peace building actors, regardless of our beliefs, is that the dynamics that currently have been brought in by the digital age are real. And they're not just about 
about being connected or not connected. They're also about how people are using these surveillance mechanisms and these uh, vulnerability that we have online in order to in order to just gain their interests. So we need to start by recognizing that, and then we need to start by. Um, and folding and and packing these dynamics and just and learning how we've been doing peace building for all these years and the truth is that it it didn't work out so why are we still just sticking to these old ways and UNOAU recently produced a policy brief on women's digital inclusion in Africa's women peace and security agenda and in it it says that while there are examples of how digital and ICTs are being used in peace building, it's not always clear if there's a gender lens being applied to the development of these digitized solutions. So as a digital peace builder, what are your thoughts on how the gender lens should be applied in the use of ICTs and new media in peace building? And I think here, I just want to make a clarification that it's so important because What we see is that we always talk about the use of ICTs and we actually confuse the use of ICTs with the governance of ICTs because regardless of how many women we would have in the ICT field, if we don't actually promote the role and the leadership of women in the governance of ICTs, we will not see any change happening because right now what is current and the current landscape is that we have big tech governing big tech and the spaces that we currently have for advocacy are not really into women's rights or into intersectionality because there are spaces just made for the internet so you 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 would never hear of like an advocacy space tackling both women's rights or gender and ICTs. You would only have spaces like the Internet Governance Forum or the the Digital Cooperation Panel or any other field that are just solely tackling the internet. And then you would have the spaces that are solely tackling women's rights or human rights or gender. So I think the day we would actually really understand that the use of ICTs is just complementary to the governance of ICTs, then we would we would bring a change because the advocacy spaces are really working in silos. And whatever you try to do, and even if you try to set the tone in one space, you would find that the others is still lagging behind. And so it's it's not about the numbers, but it's about challenging the status quo within these spaces. Have you come across really great examples of where the gender lens has been really applied in the use of digital platforms for peace building? Of course, we have that, I I would say, that landmark report of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the violence against women and its consequences. It was a dedicated report to the use of ICTs and the governance of ICTs. And of course, it was just like a continuity of that UN framework that says that the same rights that applies offline should actually apply online. And within this report, the UN Special Rapporteur has really given great examples of how the use of ICTs, of course, they just make better lives for women, but also how the, the digital space is more about just digital. It's also about how we actually help movements that connect together online, just like the LGBT movement who started online to, to continue their, their fight and to just gain or, or like fulfill their rights to, to, to assembly, to organize, to uh, association, whatever rights. So I think we have, we have different blueprints that are there. But still, it's not really coordinated or regularly coordinated with with advocacy spaces. So it's just um, a one-off agenda. Now, you you work with a couple of organizations, but you're part of the Association for Progressive Communications. So tell us about the work that you do there in relation to, you know, this idea of a feminist internet and also towards peace building? I work for the APC, the Association for Progressive Communications, as a women's rights uh, policy lead. And actually what the Association for Progressive Communications does is 
to really incorporate the use of ICTs everywhere, like basically everywhere. If we're talking about trafficking, we would talk about the impact of ICTs there. If we're talking about any other right, like child rights or or any any other agenda, we would incorporate ICTs in there, but not just incorporate, but actually challenge these dynamics and understand how how they 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 relate to different people, uh, and try to, to to just give it a local context, a local ownership, and but more concretely, concretely, what I do in my job is basically to to mainstream both. ICTs and intersectionality in different, not just advocacy and policy spaces, but also just just in, in, in different streams of work. So, and, and why I say ICTs and intersectionality or feminism, because we believe that feminists are really good at unpacking power and, and whatever is happening right now in the digital age is all about power. Like when we talk about surveillance capitalism and when we talk about these tech giants and we talk about vulnerable communities, on the other hand, and we talk about under-resourced feminist movements, under-strained feminist movements. So it's all about power, power of the government, power of these uh, spaces that are still restricted for us. And so we believe that the only that the only perspective that would really narrow down what's happening there is the feminist perspective. So we would really get a very good picture of what is happening there and just taking over control. Yeah. In in your role at APC, tell me about one of the best project you've worked on that really captures this approach you just mentioned about applying ICTs towards certain issues, right? So particularly around peace building. So talk us through that process because I'm sure that we have listeners who are really trying to understand what it means to apply a gender lens with ICT. So you really talk us through that process and what it is, it is about your work, how you do, what are the intrinsities of, of doing that? I would talk about two, two major, like, not projects, but like for me, it was like two major milestones. The first one was related to COVID-19 when actually the one of the uh, UN special procedures actually issued a call for for reports on, on the impact of COVID on domestic violence. And we've seen everywhere like how COVID has just taken a toll on on, on, on women and how how we've seen that that just increase of domestic violence. So we issued a report about the relationship of ICTs and domestic violence because it was clearly overlooked there. And we found interesting findings like how actually women, although they're not connected, they would be um, victim of either not using, for instance, ICTs, because we've, we've known that during COVID-19, um, vital information was actually spread online. So the ones who were not connected was just sinking in darkness, basically. The other ones who were connected were likely to be either, for instance, people who are working online, I mean, forcibly working online, so like women who are housewives and have their children and need to take care of their children and other people. And so how it actually, again, takes a toll on on women's lives. And we have the ones who've been stalked by their partners solely because either they're working online with their male, male colleagues or, or because they just want to stalk them, basically. And so while just doing this research, and, but also understanding how in different contexts, like access to justice has been hindered because uh, of lockdown and because there is no digitization whatsoever, and it's not actually gendered, even the services that were there, were not really taken into account the privacy of women, like even medical services or women who, who wanted to actually access to abortion or anything else. So it was an interesting finding that actually anything that has to be with 
with like with human rights has has to actually incorporate a, a digital perspective because it's 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 then help you to understand the kind of society and the kind of like social transformation uh, that is happening. Yeah, the the second milestone was during the the Palestine campaign that we were part of against the the censorship of pro-Palestine content online. And why I'm saying that? Because it was the first time we were like on a daily basis working with Facebook, Twitter, like TikTok leadership and and trying to negotiate and, and, and to find a proper compromise. And although we actually presented a lot of evidence on what is actually happening, we couldn't we couldn't really reach that compromise because again the power was so big that that nothing really nothing could could drain in what was happening there and and so it just it just really um gave us a picture of of, of like that governance you know uh, say that i've been talking about without properly you know um establishing a movement against against everything or the people in power and the people that are trying to 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 just um, stay 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 in the power we 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 wouldn't be able to to bring about change so um yeah because people when they see, when they see things happening online and when or when they just scroll down facebook they don't think about the kind of meetings that are happening uh, behind stage and so it's it's always interesting to to share these um, yeah events I mean, it's interesting. I want to pick up on what you said there about governance, because you've got, like I said earlier on, you've got background in law and in digital activism, and you've also done research on digital authoritarianism. So while the peace building industry is using digital tools more now across the four pillars of the WPS agenda, there is still a case of being mindful of its challenges, particularly around digital inclusion. So there are fears around data protection, for example, online violence, and also state regulation of digital spaces. So we see, you know, some recent examples are, for example, in Nigeria, the Twitter ban, countries like Uganda have a social media tax and so on. And yet you have successes of maybe the Arab Spring and NSARS campaign that really demonstrate the potential that these digital platforms hold to re- affect political change towards advancing human rights in those countries. So what are your reflections on state attempts at regulating social media, whether for better or for worse, in the context of the WPS agenda? Because if we are truly to have intergenerational peace building, surely social media is important in that process. I just want to start with, with a very striking fact is that whether states are established democracies or authoritarians, they are actually repressive online. They, you would find that in, in a certain manner, they wouldn't track, like, regulate always in the, in the very interests of, of the people. So we don't have a human-centered regulation, obviously. And the other striking finding that I've that I've actually come across during my research on digital authoritarianism is that states have learned how to how to censor online. The Arab Spring was actually a very good experience for states to know and to counter the kind of power that was emerging from the online space. And one great example was was a kind of experience where they actually gave people the right to navigate censored websites. So they told them, um, you, have, you have one day and you can actually use the internet the way you want. But still people have chosen to avoid those websites because they've actually come to the stage that they would censor themselves. And that's how it's working right now. You, you would either censor yourself or censor your peer because you're afraid. You're afraid of, of, of all these attempts that we've experienced with state regulation of the internet. But on the other hand, we're seeing another peaceful movement of, 
either feminist organizations or women's rights organizations or even youth organizations, peace builders, people from all walks of life who are trying to 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 just rally around in order to to build to build back better online. And we can deny that, of course, social media is vital for our association and mobilization. But obviously, there is no leadership without accountability. So if we're not able to, to be part of that process, it shouldn't be solely state-led or, 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 or actually just uh, restricted to, to the tech giants. It should, it should enable a multi-stakeholder process where, where so, many, so many actors would, would be at the table. And if we're not... It, it, it looks like, you know, the peace building table, actually, because we're trying to build peace in, in an indirect way, if that makes sense. And yeah, the kind of challenges that we find in conflict stricken areas are the kind of challenges that we are currently finding with the digital actors. So if we are to look forward now to emerging and new media technology, and expanding on the potentials of digital spaces to address some of the shortcomings, you know, of peace building processes, like you said about the peace building table, particularly when it comes to women playing that meaningful role at various stages of mediation and negotiation. How would you like to see emerging ICTs, for example, of artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, big data, and so on? How would you like to see them being used in peace building spaces? It should be used to the extent that it makes sense for the locals, you know? When we have AI, it, it doesn't resonate that much with certain contexts that it would resonate in certain like high income countries, for instance. And I think it is quite unfair to actually talk, for instance, within the African context of um, emerging technologies where 70% of the population is offline. Although we need to, to, to try to foresee that future where we would be making the best out of these emerging technologies f- for sure. But what I mean is that the deployment of, of these emerging technologies should be solely for the better of, of the society and the people. Just like we say, tech for good. Well, I'm, I think that good is not really universal because the reality across the world are really evolving and are really very, just very different So and very disparate. So I guess what we actually need to, to say is that we need these technologies, these emerging technologies for, for the local good. So whatever the reality is there, it should be very well reflected in the kind of investment that we make in technology. Absolutely. And I think you said it very well there about investments, particularly in building infrastructure and access um, in in the local context. And I think there are some examples where, for example, VR, virtual reality, is being used to demonstrate to perhaps stakeholders, funders, policymakers, what devastation is happening in a particular location. So there's been, I've seen examples of creative use in that way. So whereas it's not necessarily used with the local population, but it's used in the context of helping the policymakers and those involved in decision-making at that higher level to actually embed themselves in that local conflict and see what's actually happening locally. So I think there's some really interesting examples in that context. Yeah, there there is another very good, actually, example that would is illustrate illustrate what we've been saying, uh, which is uh, community networks. Community networks is basically when you give disenfranchised communities, let's say in a village, for instance, in Africa, you give them certain tools to build their own internet, like manually. And what we f- found with this experience is that women are likely to lead the process. And it's not just about 
even like with the kind of like villages that or, or like people within these villages are convening to actually build their own community network to access connectivity. It makes really whole change, not, not just about digital inclusion, but also in the role of like women to, to, to actually lead on these processes and to feel more confident about the kind of internet they are building, you know? And it's it's also about the community gathering around and and using the proper infrastructure that wouldn't strain them. It's not it's 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 not like just wanting to build a five G connection there where there is no infrastructure whatsoever. So you would need to make huge investments in a place where you can just give basic tools to people to build their own internet and. So it it just makes perfect sense for donors or investors or governments to really not reinvent the wheel or not just go with the flow and with whatever is happening in other parts of the world where the reality is, is, is very different, to actually think about how we can give the communities the right tools to, to build their, their, their own reality. Thank you so much, Mara, for having this interesting conversation with me. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Now, we've heard your insights on digital and digital inclusion of women in the peace building process and your professional background. So to end the interview, tell us an interesting fact about you that people won't find on Google. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That was quite an impromptu question. <laughs> <laughs> I always love catching people off guard with it. <laughs> I need to think about that. <laughs> Let me think. <laughs> Doesn't have to be anything to be work related, just to, no. you know, anything about you. Yeah. An interesting fact about myself, because people, if they like Google my name, perhaps they will think, oh, that's that's someone who works a lot or that's, that's a hustler, you know, uh, just taking on different like path and kind of work whatever but I'm I'm a very lazy person like I'm I'm someone who who doesn't like to work a lot I just like to get it done in, in a very like short and concise manner and perhaps it goes back to my engineering background like even when I used to study law after studying engineering I used to write just a tiny bit and it would piss off my my professors like tell me, <laughs> you should write lengthy lengthy sentences I was like but why it just makes the same sense why do I have <laughs> to write like lengthy sentences and it's just about the kind of you know mindset that people have depending on their background so mm. for me I just want to get it done in 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 the shortest manner and adult. I'll I'll go back to my laziness. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm definitely an advocate in making life simple and easy. So thank you so much Mawa for sharing that with us. You have been listening to She Stands for Peace, the podcast series that explores the state of the women peace and security agenda in Africa, asking the central question 20 years after UNSCR 1325, how far have we come? I am Dr. Yemsi Akimbobola, your host, and this podcast was produced by the United Nations Office to the African Union with the generous support of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 